workshop. If I could have the speakers for the uh, second um, panel uh, kind of kindly uh, wait in line. <laughs> be seated uh, at the uh, table. That would be great. That's uh, Chan Fabrice. Uh,
It is at 21 days from today. We're having a meeting discussing this patient now. So it's actually really unlikely we'll implant the patient in the afternoon. So what do you mean by 21 days from today? Uh, if we just wait for 21 days, what will happen? And I was just like, uh, we predicted 21 days based on you know previous patients similar to this patient and they died or whatever. So we explained a, a, a lot about it. And they, then the doctors say, wait, wait, is it really ethical if we decided not to implant this patient, basically give this patient a death sentence because previous patients like him didn't perform well? Is this really the right thing to do? And then there are other surgeons, surgeons who actually, of course, do the, do the work, do put, the, put the artificial heart in people's body. And they said, wait, these predictions are based on our best efforts, right? You know there are days that I had a fight with my wife the day before. Um, I, like, do you mean like this 21 days is the outcome of my best effort, or is it like the day of my fight after day? Um, I said, well, it depends on the training data. It depends on the previous cases did you fight with your wife or before the surgery. Anyway, it's complicated. And then, and I think this quote, I think, really represents, kind of summarizes this um, situation well. The, this doctor who had, had some experience in machine learning, and he said, you know, machine learning really helps us measure the risks of each, each patient. But if you think a measurement of the risk can determine what we do, you really ignore the fact that our, the doctor's job is to manage these risks, is to take risks for the benefit of the patient. So yes, it would be valuable to see a, an accurate, relatively accurate measure of the patient uh, of the current condition, but it really can do very little in terms of informing our um, taking care of the patient. And I said, well, you know, it's really machine learning really just mines the patterns, gives you a suggestion. It's not causality. Um, it really just shows a correlation. So. It's not trying to suggest what you do, but really just inform your decision. And the doctors at that point said, wait, it's not causality. Um, because one of the, some of the most difficult part of their decision making is to determine causality versus correlation. Um, a patient at the stage of accepting artificial heart implant, most, most likely all of their organs are pretty bad. In, in bad shape because the heart um, is, lacking uh, blood pumping from the heart. Um, so for the doctors, it's their task to determine whether it's the other organs that are um, sick and having problems, which will lead to complications after the surgery, or are they bad because the heart was bad, so they will recover after the surgery. So they, th this differentiation between um, correlation and causality is the very center of their job, and they were shocked to realize that the predictions we gave are not uh, p-valued or like, uh, statistically uh, validated in terms of causality. So I think these quotes really push us to think what is um, the sort of ideal clinician AI collaboration we're envisioning. What is the unique value machine learning can provide um, for this for this particular scenario? Question. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> So, okay, the second um, case study I want to show, it's, I promise you, it's more related than it seems. <laughs> uh, this is a project I did with Microsoft Research last summer. I was working with a group of NLP researchers, and they were looking at different ways of embedding language intelligence into Microsoft Office. But of course, first, you want to understand what are the functionalities do people even want um, in these scenarios. So we designed this study. We invited a bunch of people into, uh, uh, to, to write whatever documents they're already writing or they were planning to write, and we asked them to put an X sign. So it's kind of similar to how you write a hashtag um, on, uh, when you're writing Twitter. And ask them to put in the request they have either for themselves or their collaborators or some intelligent writing assistance. So this is one example, one, one part passage that our participants wrote insert a, an intro paragraph that isn't too cheesy. So we did a, in the back end, we had a wizard of Oz sort of approach. Uh, so when the next time the user clicked on that request, he or, sh uh, he or she will see 
um, so either search results related on the web or um, machine generated text. Here are some quotes also from the participants. Okay, this person said, well, yeah, the machine re uh, generated text reads very good, but I want to see the next two sentences. I want to see the context of that generated text because the true meaning of a sentence comes two paragraphs later. It's always, right, when, you, when, when anyone writes a sentence, it is to see the idea that comes two paragraphs later. So I told him, like, this is a machine generated text. There isn't really a context. You cannot find the context. So, and then, so the person said, wait, isn't this plagiarism? Like, I was taught if you use um, six consecutive words from another piece of article, you need to cite it, otherwise it is not right. Um, so I was lectured, basically, about <laughs> how using some other uh, a te a passage or text from another source is not ethical. Anyway, I, I want to show these quotes to you. I think it's very much a us to talk about how human-centered can we be when we're talking about human-centered machine learning, when we have already selected a bunch of solutions for the users. Um, most of the time, when we talk about explainability, we can accept the user say, oh, I prefer this over that. I prefer uh, this algorithm to be less biased, for example, between male and female uh, patients. But what if the doctors say, I want causality. I don't want correlation at all. Can we accept machine learning is just not the answer? And Maybe not, maybe we want to strike a balance between this human-centeredness and machine learning-centeredness, I guess. Um, then in the process, how early should we, how early in the design process should we involve real users? Should we just do like a whatever fake system? It doesn't need to be any, for both of the studies I've presented, there, there actually isn't any need for a real algorithm to be functioning. And how early should we start really building, start collecting data and building a functioning machine learning system? And I think it's these questions that really interest me in terms of how can we actually eventually lead to a process, lead to a product that's human-centered and actually does um, show the benefit of machine learning in people's real lives. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. By impossible, you mean causality. For example, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, so uh, in terms of a design process for that clinical project, well, we have more details in the paper, of course, but um, we started when we designed the slides, we have already considered what's possible versus not. That is why we showed those particular predictions and we showed the range of error, which is quite reflective of what the, what the real algorithm's error will be like. Um, so we, the, the goal is really just to probe um, how the users react, how the clinicians react. Um, I think in terms of how to improve on that, I think there is a lot to do with how to explain the value of a prediction versus a causality in the first place. There is value in predictive information. Um, it's just that when we usually talk about explainable, yeah, we're talking about the inner functioning of the AI system, not what it is in the first place, what the value it has in people's real decision making. Uh, really great talk. I loved all the quotes. Um, I, I know this isn't the point, but I am curious of what was the sort of uh, ML system or, or artful fake that you were using for these studies? I see. Um, so for the clinical case, it wasn't, it's quite simplistic. It's that we know these are predictions we can make. Um, 
spend more time faking those patient cases <laughs> than the algorithms, uh, uh, actually, um, because it turns out it's not that easy to just come up with an entirely new like, fictional location. Um, for, the, for the NLP one, we designed a different with the Lavas structures for each different features. For machine, uh, for machine generated text, for example, we have each wizard plays one module of the deep learning algorithm. Somebody, for example, takes care of topic relevance. The other takes care of, um, let's say, coherence with the larger context. And then there is a meta classifier decides which part of the response did it take and generates sort of an intelligently flawed uh, response. So that's how the, yeah, that's one example of how that NLP part works. We'll talk about